And finally, what gets it all done is undue influence in our political system of these dirty oil and gas and coal companies. A year ago, Dr. Maureen Hackett was running against Jim Meffert for the DFL Congressional District 3 endorsement to challenge Republican incumbent Eric Paulson in the general election. She barely lost the endorsement race, but Maureen Hackett, so to speak, is still running. Running hard as an informed and resonant advocate for clean air and clean water. Maureen, I'm so glad you're back. Thanks for having me, Jeff. So it seems it's all about pollution, oil, big corporations, pipelines, more pollution, and oil spills. And finally, what gets it all done is undue influence in our political system of these dirty oil and gas and coal companies. What's happening with that pipeline uh, coming from the tar sands in Alberta down to the Gulf Coast? Well, first of all, we still here in Minnesota use tar sands oil. There is a pipeline that we do uh, get oil from there. But the XL2, the large Keystone Energy Pipeline, has been delayed. The route is being looked at again. Uh, there was a lot of activism that went into uh, getting to Obama the message that this is dirty oil. This is oil that uses 40% more greenhouse gases just to get the oil. They remove four tons of earth for every barrel of oil, is, that's another estimate. And the earth that's moved is the boreal forest. The boreal forest houses many of our migratory birds and provides habitat. And already, the size of Florida or the size of France, depending on who you listen to, has been disrupted in Alberta for oil, tar sands oil. The route was going to go through the Sandhill Crane habitat, the Sandhills of Nebraska, and the Nebraska governor um, and other politicians were against it. So it's been delayed. What I would say is we focus so much on where that pipeline is going because we focus on what would a spill do. But when I went to the Gulf of Mexico, I found out that, you know, there really is no such thing as an oil spill cleanup. Because what happens is those booms that are contaminated, all of that um, uh, fabric that they use to sop it up and, and they burn the oil off so it goes into the air or the methane gas. But the reality is, is I learned from oil spill cleanup executives that much of those uh, contaminated materials were going to be shipped up the river and put in the ground in the Midwest. In the Midwest. In the Midwest. And it's been done before. And we as citizens don't really know about this. Well, they're doing it already in the Gulf Coast states, aren't they? Contaminated soils and, and sea sand and, and dumping it in Mississippi and poor towns. And yes, there's there. no place to put uh, contaminated materials except in neighborhoods where people have no political power and have no uh, means to fight that pollution of their environment. So. I, what I say to people is there, there is displacement of oil, but there's not a, a cleanup. There's no such thing. So when we talk about putting an oil drill in the Arctic, I, I just can't imagine uh, the fact that there are, it's several, several hundred miles from where they want to put the pipeline to the first Coast Guard station, several hundred miles in, in freezing Arctic waters. There won't be a cleanup. There won't be anybody to witness it. And that's really what they depend on with deep water drilling. Nobody witnesses the devastating effects until maybe a dolphin carcass you know, shows up on the shores. The shrimp are now showing up deformed. It was on um, Canadian Broadcasting Radio uh, with an interview with a uh, shrimper from the bayou. He, he reported that the shrimp were coming up deformed. Every day they would find new deformities in the shrimp and, and the much lower stock. So the cost of these dirty fossil fuels is much greater than the cost of production and the cost of putting a pipeline in. We bear the costs on our health. We're bearing the costs on our future with climate change. Now, the, the Obama administration did delay. Yes. They want to study it more. Yes. Now, is that a sign that the Obama administration is becoming more sensitive to uh, people like yourself and the environment? In my opinion, um, I will hold judgment on that because I think one of the biggest influences on delaying this was the almost scandalous news through the New York Times that people in the State Department were essentially lobbying for TransCanada, former, a former employee, the former deputy uh, campaign uh, manager for Hillary Clinton was working with TransCanada also. 
the company that was hired for the environmental review was chosen by TransCanada, and the company that was hired for the environmental review was basically running the, the hearings. I think that that scandal helped halt the project for now because it was the State Department that had the green light and had given the green light. But still, we're going to have more oil drilling in the Gulf and the Arctic? Yes, the Arctic has been expanded and so is the Gulf. And, and while we think about spills and we think about the devastating effects of the drilling on the environment and the habitat, everybody needs to think about what will burning all of that fossil fuel do to our climate crisis that we are experiencing right now. We're kind of in the 11th hour right now. We don't have much time to make no, changes. No, we have, we have very little time. I, I find it fascinating when people talk about the year 2037 when they're talking about the health care bill. That's 26 years from now. And in, in just in the last 26 years, we've, we've um, pushed our carbon up oh, about 40 parts per million. We're now at about 394. We passed 350 in about 1988. We're, we're really um, running on borrowed time. You know, I think that ultimately how we're going to make the biggest change is what I think people at the Occupy movements are, are talking about, which is the undue influence of corporate uh, money on our political system. That no matter how much you talk to somebody whose hands are tied by the fact that they are in, uh, funded by these dirty energy companies, no matter on both sides of the aisle, it's, it's, it's going, we're, we're a voice in, in the wilderness. Thank you so much, I really appreciate that. Your name is? People are energized, people are here, people want to express themselves, and I, I like that. Um, I think Maureen, you've been visiting the demonstrations done at Hennepin County Government Center. What's your thought? Well, I think that Occupy Minnesota started in solidarity with Occupy Wall Street, like many of the occupations throughout the country. And I think the reason it, it sort of caught fire, so to speak, and so many people have rallied around it is because their first target was Wall Street. And people really know something happened, something was wrong with the way our financial services sector has taken down uh, world markets and put us in a, a very large recession. So some people really have a deep understanding of that down at the government center, which is called People's Plaza now. Others just know there's something wrong. There are many people there who have many stories, and we've been collecting, or they've been, I've, I'm part of the cohesive messaging group. I participated more intensely for the first few weeks, and my job and other things have, have take precedence also, so I haven't been there all the time. But I've looked at the statements. We've been gathering stories, 99 stories for the 99%. And some of the stories are about people who have no health care and have cancer, people who are students overburdened with high interest rate loans for their schooling that can't continue their schooling, people who are homeless because they've been foreclosed on because of the uh, predatory lending practices of mortgages. So there are many stories down there, but more than anything, people want to see um, ha uh, having more of a voice in how government is run and getting the corrupting influences out of government and corporations. Hi there, what do you guys think of this? I think it's great, I'm with these people. Good. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, we both support them, so it's, it's great. Democratic Visions is handmade by volunteers for DFL Senate District 42, Lori Pryor, Chair. Democratic Visions can also be seen on YouTube and at dflsd42.org.